It's great to see you up here in the front again. We missed that the last couple of months, so it's good to have you guys here. Um, I'm going to do a little um, excuse for my sermon, just in case it doesn't work out. Um, when you're sitting in a tree stand and putting it together, you don't have a pen and paper that you can write because you'd scare the animals away. And you do get interrupted once in a while by animals, which is the point of being in a tree stand. So my thoughts might not have come together all that clearly, but I hope they did. You know, there's none of us that like to be used. We don't like to be taken advantage of. When someone takes advantage of us, we usually fight back. We want to protect what is ours. We don't like people to take what is ours and try have it for themselves. And so we kind of have this policy that uh, what's mine is mine and you go get your own kind of thing. And in society, the church has kind of adopted, or society has kind of adopted that with the church. They believe that because you're the church, you have to help me. Well, that's not the situation necessarily, but that's been adopted. So we don't like to be used by people. And we don't like to be abused by people. In Luke chapter 11... Jesus is telling some woes there. And in in the 11th chapter and starting in verse about uh, 46, he says, Woe to you lawyers. And the reason he says that is because this lawyer comes to Jesus and he said, You know, these things you've been saying, um, they insult us. Do you know you're insulting us? And Jesus probably said, Yeah, I do. (laughs) But he said, Woe to you lawyers. He says, For... You bind, you load people with burdens and that are hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. You know, we don't like to be abused either. But we fight back on those things. We don't like to be inconvenienced. We live in a society that is a society of convenience. I mean, if it isn't convenient, it's too much. If it takes any kind of effort to get something, then it's really, we want to let it go. We want everything to drop into our laps. We're, we like our comforts. Um, we, we get what we want, and we don't necessarily want to share that with other people because that might mess up my conveniences. And so we don't want to do that either. We don't want to be put out. We don't want to miss out on something for the sake of another person. It's all about kind of looking after what I want. And, and um, if you want something and it's going to make me suffer a little bit, and not really suffer, just miss out on something that probably isn't that important anyways, then I don't want that to happen. I've earned it. It's mine. It's my right. We have all of these things. And so... We have that situation in our mind. So as Christians then, as representatives of Christ, how do we respond when we get that kind of treatment? The Jews, they responded like this. They said, we are God's special people. We don't deserve this. This is, we deserve better than this. We shouldn't even be under this pagan rule. These pagans have taken us into captivity. We are better than they are. And we don't deserve this. And now we can't wait for God to come back and destroy these people. You see, they had an attitude that said, because... God chose us to be a special people. Whether we obeyed Him or not, or whether we lived by His laws or not, that's irrelevant. He owes us this, and we shouldn't have to suffer anything because we're His special people. And that carried out through the generations. And when Jesus came, they experienced that. They had those experiences. And and Jesus came and He taught against that. So, But the Jews didn't want to listen to the Romans. They didn't want to obey them. They didn't want to do anything they wanted them to do. They wanted to do their own thing. And the problem with that was they did the same thing with God. 
That was really their issue. But then the Christians in the first century had a struggle as well. You see, the Jews, Paul teaches in Romans chapter 11 that they fell from the grace of God because of their disobedience. And he throws in there that it was partially to help for the salvation of the Gentiles. And we have to understand that in context and everything. But then the, the, the Gentile Christians kind of were starting to elevate themselves and thinking, hey, we're the good guys. We're the, we're the important ones. We're the, the best. And, and so Paul had to remind them that they were grafted in. And if God, and he gives them a warning. He says, if God dealt with the natural branches in that way, that he destroyed them because of their disbelief and their disobedience to him, how much more will that happen to you who are grafted in if you get this arrogant attitude that you're everything and that no one else is like you? If you get that kind of an attitude, you're going to fall from grace as well. And how, how much more severe is he going to deal with the grafted in ones? You see, in 1 Corinthians 12, 10 and verse 12, Paul had to warn the Corinthian church Take heed if you think you stand, lest you fall. Because it's just human nature to think when well, we've made it, we've, we've achieved something, we've got it, that we're the best. And there's nothing can undo that. Well, it can. Uh, if you don't believe that, go bow hunting. That's very humbling. You'll learn that really quickly. But it's true. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 3, Paul warned him, he said, don't think of yourselves more highly than you ought to. So he had to warn the church continually to keep things in proper perspective. And Christians today, well, we kind of struggle with the same thing. I don't know about you, but I don't particularly like to be taken advantage of. And I can carry this attitude of I won't be taken advantage of Try it. Just try it and see what will happen. And I know Christians that do that. And then there's the idea that of Christians today or people that call themselves Christians that go out and shoot the abortion doctor and say they're doing a favor for God. Well, they're not. They're not even listening to God if they're doing that because they've missed the whole point. But they're doing this because they think they're better than, than the other person or they're right and the other person's wrong and so that's our right to do that. But they, in, in doing that, they break so many things of the will of God and they're not paying attention to those things like don't murder and all of those things. So Christians today need to heed the warnings of Paul that he gave to the Christians in the first century. We still need to not think more highly of ourselves than we ought to. We need to take heed lest we fall. If we think we're really good and we stand and we're, we're solid and we're the rock, warning, beware. You might fall. And that fall could be hard. And so we see this in the Jews and the Christians. What causes that problem? What is the cause of those things? Because I think if we get to the cause of those things, then we can solve the issue. See, what causes it is, one thing, is selfishness. When I am self-centered, when I am all about me, I have a really hard time even thinking what that other person might be, do, might be involved in or what their situation might be or what they might be struggling through. I don't have any empathy for them because I'm so involved in myself that I can't possibly think about their situation. And so they may have a terrible situation. Now, I'm not saying that we should all go out and get abused. I'm not saying that or used. We're not supposed to use one another either. But it does happen in the world. And sometimes when we're faced with that, we have to deal with those situations. But when it's all about me, and I want to do what I want to do, and I want to get what I have to, or want to get, and, and all of those things, it's pretty hard to take your mind and set it on someone else or put it in their situation and say, Ooh, how might they be suffering? 
What can I do to help them to eliminate some struggles in their life? It, it's really hard to do that when you're selfish. And if you're a prideful person, it's just as hard. Because when you're a prideful person, that's when you think that you're better than someone else. I'm a Christian. I don't deserve this. They shouldn't be able to do that to me. It's my right to have this and this. And, and, that, and, and people have used all kinds of things. And Christianity is an excuse for all kinds of things. I heard one fellow say that because he was a Christian, he didn't pay his taxes. Now think about that for a minute. I think it was Paul that said, pay your taxes. Give the government what's the government's, Jesus said, and give the Lord what's the Lord's. And, and all of those teachings, and he missed all of that. And he said, I'm a Christian, and I don't have to do that. And he disobeyed authority, as we talked about in our Bible class this morning. So pride can be another one of those things that gets in our way and gives us a bad reaction when we're confronted with the scenarios we talked about. Sometimes pride doesn't want us to look bad. You know, what happens if my uppity-up friends come by and I'm helping a person that's down and out on their luck on the street and they see me doing that? That's kind of like the Pharisees did with Jesus. Why are you eating with sinners and tax collectors when you could be with us elite group here and, and be sharing all the stuff we have, right? Right? That's what pride does. And pride says, who are they to be able to do that to me? I mean, this is mine. They have no right to it. And, and all of that comes from our perspective of things. How we think. The way we think. When I think I don't deserve it, I'm not sure I'm thinking right. Because if I remember right, Jesus didn't deserve to go to the cross either. But he did. For us. For me. For my sin. He went to the cross. He didn't deserve it. So what don't I deserve? Or maybe I have some unreal expectations. Maybe I expect because as a Christian, I shouldn't have to suffer. Well, Peter said that, that you better expect that to happen as a Christian in your life. Maybe it's because of the desires I have. And I'm focused on my desires more than on the desire of God. That can get in the way. But that's a perspective that we might have. Maybe it's my wants. I'll guarantee you this. It's never about our needs. Because I have seen people that are needy and still share with others. So it's not necessarily that. And that person wasn't even a Christian that I'm referring to. So where does that put us as Christians? But you see, our problems come when, we have, when we're self-centered, when we're prideful, when we think about things the wrong way. That's when we run into problems. And Jesus gives us the cure in Matthew chapter uh, 5. Matthew chapter 5 and starting in verse 38. He says, You have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now I don't know how much you understand about that, but in the Old Testament, God wanted the people to see that you don't do something to someone that you don't want done to yourself. So, you don't go and knock a guy's eye out because it's going to cost you your eye. The plan was not for vengeance. The plan was not to get even. But that's how the Jews took it. The teaching there was don't do it. It was preventative. Don't do it because that's what it's going to cost you. And so it wasn't about getting even or, or, or vengeance because vengeance is God's. But their thinking wasn't in line with God's. And so they said, huh, 
I dare you to take my eye, or dare you to knock my tooth out, I'll knock, I get to knock your tooth out. And then it became, I get to knock two of your teeth out. <laughs> well, whoops, I hit you a little too hard, and I hit you and knocked two teeth out, right? So they, they had this struggle, but the idea of the eye for an eye was to say, be careful what you're doing, be aware of what you're doing, so it doesn't cost you. That was what God wanted them to see. And then he says, But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil, but if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other cheek also. And I looked that up and I researched that. And he's not talking about someone coming up and actually slapping you on the cheek. I mean, they did that. But it wasn't like knock you off your feet slap. It was just a slap on the face. And that was an insult, is what it was. And so Jesus says, if you're insulted, and I know it's not nice to be insulted, and, and our feelings get hurt, and, and all of that. But Jesus says, if he slaps you here, say, here you go, take that one too. He's not saying, okay, if someone wants to beat you up, tell them to beat you up good. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, don't take it personally. The insult isn't a big deal. Don't cave to the evils that will result if you retaliate with evil, with insult. Have you ever been insulted and you insult someone back and, and you hear them and the voices are elevating and, and they're getting, the insults are getting worse and they're going back and forth? Who wins in that situation? Nobody. But if you smile and say, well, I'm sorry, you feel that way when they insult you? And I've done this and it works. They have a right to their feelings, I guess. But I don't have to take it personal. In fact... Try this sometime. When someone insults you, feel sorry for that person. Because perhaps they're struggling with an esteem issue that it's, that's their way of trying to lift themselves up and they don't know any better. How about praying for that person? I think Jesus was the one that said, pray for your enemies. And so he's saying here, don't worry about an insult. Don't get into a battle that's going to take you into an evil or wrong situation because of a little insult. And he said, and if, if um, anyone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. Now, I don't know how you understand the dress of the Middle East, but the, the tunic was underneath and the cloak was over top. And the cloak was the expensive one. The tunic was the cheap one. And so when they sued him for the tune, Jesus said, if they want that, give them the other two. Give them all of it. He's saying rather than to get into a fight where it's tooth for tooth and eye for eye and, and evil for evil, he's saying avoid all that stuff. It's beautiful to resist the evils of these things by simply saying, yeah, have it. It's not going to kill me. Things aren't nearly as important as life. And if you take that perspective and you think about it, if your eternal life is important and you need to act like Jesus, and this is how Jesus says you want to act, then things can't be that important to you. And that's what it comes down to. And then he says something very interesting. He says, and if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Now the Roman... They were, I forget the name they were called now, but they, they were messengers from the Roman government. And when they were sent out, they were sent out to a district, to a, a person that was ruling over a district. And that district could have been a long ways off. And there's no one horse was going to make it that far. And so they jump on a horse, and the first, the, horse was, the first horse was given to them by the one sending them out. He could ride that horse till that horse couldn't do anymore and he could stop and it didn't matter who was on the way. He could say, I'm taking that animal. But it didn't stop there. He could say, I'm taking that animal and I'm taking that cart and the food for me too and the horse. And then he could do one more thing. He could also say, and by the way, you're toting some of my stuff as well. You're going with me and making sure I get there or you carrying some of my stuff. And he could take the person. And if the person refused any one of those things, 
He could execute him on the spot. He had the authority to execute him on the spot. That was the judgment for resisting authority. The Roman authority. And so Jesus says, if he comes along and he says, carry my stuff for one mile, Jesus said, do it for two miles. Well, why would he do that? Because he says it's better to just do these things that aren't in the overall picture going to kill you or hurt you that badly anyways. Just do them rather than resisting and getting into a wrong situation or you end up doing something wrong. And that's what he's talking about. And then he says, give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Now he's... It's interesting because in a society where everything is mine and I want to hold on to and protect it at all costs, it's difficult to give to someone else. And so he says, don't be so hung up on that stuff. Let it go. It's not the end of the world. Now I'm not advocating for any moment here that someone should just go and, and let everybody run all over. I'm not saying that. And Jesus wouldn't have that either because Jesus teaches that people shouldn't do that as well and they need to learn their lesson. But I think he's talking here about in a little bit more of a legitimate sense where they need these things. But if it, he says, let them have it. I mean, the thing isn't all that important. In Philippians chapter uh, 2, if I can find it, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 3 and 4, Paul said, Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. You know, you can't have the mind of our society and look at the interests of others. You have to have the mind of Christ to look at the interest of others. And that's what he's putting forth here. We're afraid to be used. We're afraid to lose everything. But Jesus says, be more afraid about losing life than losing things. Because that's what's really important, is that I've given you life. And, and so we get it kind of confused. We, we kind of wonder, it doesn't make sense to us. You know, in Northern Europe, there's a little animal called an ermine. And that ermine, in the winter, his fur turns pure white. And it's beautiful. And that ermine will instinctively protect the purity of that white coat at all costs. It will not get dirty. And part of it's for his survival because he could actually lay in the snow and you'd never know he was there. And so the fur hunters really want this fur. And so what they did is they said, we're not going to trap him because we've studied the instinctive nature of this animal. And so instead, what we're going to do is we're going to go to their home, which was often in the cleft of a rock or in the hollow of a tree or something like that. We're going to go to their home and we're just going to smear grime all over the entrance of their home. And then they would turn the dogs loose to find the ermine. And that scared little animal would run for home and he'd get right to the door of his home and he would stop. And because he didn't want to get his coat dirty, he would be captured by the dogs. And so the purity of, that, of his coat overrides life. Now, we kind of get the same attitude sometimes. Only it's not purity that concerns us, it's things. And we start thinking that the things may be more precious than life itself. And so we want to hang on to the things. We don't want to let go. And we act that way until death comes knocking at our door. And even at that, sometimes people will fight to the death for their things. And they put their things over life itself. And so when we're thinking that way, what Jesus says here makes no sense. 
Why would I give up what I have to someone else? Why would I help someone else out? Why would I let someone insult me and get away with it? They think they're getting away with it. They're not getting away with it with God. But they think they're getting away with it. They're not. And besides, it keeps the peace. And you don't get into an, an area you don't want to be in of vengeance and retaliation. So Jesus teaches us that life is more important than things. Eternity is far more important than the temporal. And so let go of the things. Go the extra mile. It's not going to kill you anyways. If someone insults you, pray for them. Don't take it personal. Unless you've done something to deserve it, maybe then you've got an issue. But if someone insults you, especially for the name of Christ, they're the one that has the issue, not you, so why take it personal? And that's all Jesus is saying. And he said, I've left you that example. I died on the cross for you. I suffered all of that humiliation before the cross. I went through all of that, and I didn't deserve it. It wasn't owed to him, but he went through all of it for you and I. He did it so we can live. He gave us that example. Peter says in, in chapter 2 and verse 21, he suffered so that we have an example how we should also suffer for him. And then Peter says something else that we just don't like. He says in 1 Peter 4 and 13, he says, Rejoice in your suffering. What? Rejoice in my suffering? But Christ did because he brought life to a dead world. He rejoiced in his suffering. And if we rejoice in our suffering for Christ, the reward, I mean, you're not even good. The reward is so out of this world, unimaginably good that we can't even fathom it being with the Lord eternally, with our Creator God. So listen to Jesus. I think that's how we handle those situations when we get into them. If you're here this morning and you're not in Christ, it'd be a good time to get in Christ, to be immersed into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit while we stand and sing. We Where we need to follow.